The United Kingdom has witnessed some pretty terrible and ruthless monarchs over the years. To be fair, a kingdom with a history as long and as turbulent as Britain's is bound to have had its fair share of incompetent rulers. While some of these people have been pure evil, others have just been useless due to mental illness or general incompetence. From the tyrant Tudor king who took six wives, to the useless Scottish queen who lost her head, we're counting down five of the UK's worst monarchs. Henry VI was the last Lancastrian king and is infamous for his incompetence. He was far from a terrible person, however. Unlike his namesake, Henry VIII, he was not a tyrant and did not relish violence. In fact, Henry was a pious and forgiving man, a man of compassion. When I say that he was a terrible king, I mean that he was utterly useless. The problem with Henry was that periodic bouts of madness rendered him completely incapable of leading the country. To be fair, he had a lot to live up to. His father, Henry V, was the legendary champion of Agincourt, a king who was a renowned leader and tactician. A born general, Henry V had secured huge territories in Normandy and France and had gotten himself recognised as heir to the French crown. When he died of dysentery, however, in September 1422, young Henry inherited the English throne. I say young, he was barely nine months old. As if this wasn't enough responsibility for the baby king, when the French king died several months later, he also found himself king of France. As Henry grew up, it became apparent he was not suited to the responsibilities of kingship. Whilst his father had been most comfortable making a name for himself on the battlefield, young Henry had no taste for violence and was most at home talking to God in his private chapel. Henry, whilst extremely pious, was also utterly incompetent. He had no interest in politics and delegated the responsibility of governance to his most trusted advisers, namely the Duke of Somerset. Unfortunately, some pretty incompetent decisions led to the loss of most of his territories in France and Normandy, and Henry's main rival for the throne had something to say about this. Having previously been sent to govern Ireland as lieutenant, Richard Duke of York, aka Richard Plantagenet, returned to England in 1450, intent on putting right the wrongs of Henry's advisers. In actual fact, Richard technically had a better claim to the throne than Henry, and so began his struggle to get his family recognised as heirs to the throne. Richard clashed with Henry's advisers, and in particular his ambitious French wife, Margaret of Anjou. This was the start of the dynastic struggle we know today as the Wars of the Roses. Henry VI will forever be known for his incompetence and for the mental illness he struggled with for much of his life. He will also be remembered as a catalyst for one of the bloodiest series of wars ever fought on British soil. Whilst Henry VI was England's last Lancastrian king, Richard III was the last Yorkist king. Ultimately, the downfall of Henry VI led to the Wars of the Roses and the rise of the House of York. Richard Plantagenet pressed his claim to the throne but lost his life at the Battle of Wakefield. He had three surviving sons. Edward Earl of March, soon to be King Edward IV of England, George Duke of Clarence, a treacherous and self-centred individual, and the youngest of three, Richard Duke of Gloucester, later to become King Richard III of England. Following his death, Richard Plantagenet's claim to the throne was taken up by his eldest remaining son, Edward Earl of March. Richard III is a controversial character, no thanks to Shakespeare. Over the years, Richard has been painted as a bit of a monster, with his crooked spine, withered arm and treacherous nature. Significantly, Richard is alleged to have murdered his nephews and rightful heirs to the throne, Princes Edward and Richard. Of course, Shakespeare's portrayal of Richard is largely unfair and inaccurate. In fact, there is no evidence to suggest that Richard was anything other than totally loyal to his older brother, King Edward. He also pledged an oath to uphold his nephew's right to inherit the throne. That said, Following the death of King Edward in 1483, Richard appears to have gone back on his word. Whilst on his deathbed, Edward mobilised his most trusted lords and advisers and established a council to lead the country until his young son Edward came of age. Within weeks of the king's death, however, Richard staged a coup and had himself named as protector of the king. Furthermore, prior to young Edward being crowned, Richard had him and his younger brother declared illegitimate and seized the throne for himself. Worse still, both Edward and Richard were banished to the Tower of London, where they later disappeared in a shroud of mystery. Of course, it is believed that their uncle Richard had them murdered, removing them permanently as challengers to the throne. Richard was proclaimed King Richard III and ruled for barely two years. He was killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, 
in effect bringing an end to the Wars of the Roses and giving rise to the Tudor dynasty. Richard would turn up some years later, buried beneath a car park in Leicester. Mary Queen of Scots, not to be confused with Bloody Mary, was Scotland's most useless monarch. A series of stupid and politically dangerous decisions led to her swift downfall. She isolated herself from her nobles and attempted to overthrow the Queen of England. She was ultimately beheaded for her treachery. Mary had a bit of a fairy tale childhood, born in 1542 to the Scottish King James V and his French wife Mary of Guise. She was sent to live with the French royal family at the age of only five. She was loved in France, considered to be exceptionally lovely, kind and courteous. Having been betrothed to the French heir to the throne Francis, she later found herself queen of both Scotland and France. When Francis died, however, Mary took the decision to return to Scotland. Here, she found herself in a difficult situation. While she had been raised as a Catholic, Scotland was officially a Protestant country. This did not faze Mary, however, as she encouraged a policy of non-discrimination. Things, however, were about to take a turn for the worst. Mary was all too aware that she must marry and provide an heir. In 1565, she married her first cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. But Darnley was a horrid man, weak and selfish. Understandably, their marriage broke down and Mary became close to her advisor, David Rizzio. In March 1566, when Mary was six months pregnant, Darnley broke into her supper room with a posse of nobles and stabbed Rizzio to death. They claimed that he and Mary were having an affair and Rizzio was using this to gain influence in court. Mary believed that Darnley wished to kill her and her unborn son and claim the throne for himself. It was then mightily suspicious when three months later Darnley was found dead following an explosion at a house where he had been staying. His body was found outside however, giving rise to speculation that he had escaped from the blast but had been murdered. The chief suspect was James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. Here, Mary made a catastrophic mistake in marrying the Earl, barely three months after the death of Darnley. In doing so, Mary turned Scotland's nobles against her and she was in prison at Loch Leven Castle. She was then forced to abdicate in favour of her son who became King James VI of Scotland. Mary managed to escape her Protestant captors and raised an army. On the 13th of May 1568 she was defeated in battle and fled to England to seek refuge from her Protestant cousin Queen Elizabeth. This was a terrible mistake. The problem was that Mary had a strong claim to the English throne, arguably more so than Elizabeth. Whilst Elizabeth was descended from Henry VIII's second wife Anne Boleyn, Mary was a descendant of Henry's older sister Margaret Tudor. Mary's Catholic supporters viewed Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn as illegal and thus argued Mary had a better claim to the throne of England. Elizabeth was all too aware of Mary's position and had her imprisoned for 19 years. During this time, Mary was implicated in numerous Catholic-sponsored plots against Elizabeth, most significantly the Badlington plot. This was in fact a trap which implicated Mary in a bogus assassination attempt. Although reluctant to do so, Elizabeth sentenced her cousin to death and she lost her head on the 8th of February 1587. Interestingly, Mary's son James VI went on to succeed Elizabeth in 1603 and became the very first king of both Scotland and England. This in effect created the Kingdom of Great Britain. Henry VIII is one of England's most notorious kings, most commonly known for taking six wives. Often described as a tyrant, Henry is also infamous for dissolving the monasteries and breaking with Rome. Henry was almost not king, however. Dishonour was meant for his older brother, Arthur, who died suddenly in 1502. As a second son of Henry VII and his wife, Elizabeth of York, Henry VIII was obsessed with securing his own dynasty and sought to wipe out any resistance to his rule. To this end, the king was ruthless, having executed or imprisoned all those who had even the slightest claim to the throne. King Henry was obsessed with securing a male heir. After becoming frustrated with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, he fell in love with the young and beautiful Anne Boleyn. When the Pope refused to annul his marriage, Henry set out on a path of destruction, dissolving 800 monasteries and forming the Protestant Church of England. As we know, Anne was arrested on charges of adultery and beheaded at the Tower of London. Henry took four more wives. Jane Seymour provided Henry with a son, but died in childbirth. He was so repulsed by his next wife, Anne of Cleves, that he divorced her almost instantly. 
The teenage Catherine Howard was beheaded for adultery, and his last wife, Catherine Parr, somehow managed to keep her head and outlived him. Particularly in his later years, Henry became fat, obsessive, paranoid, and narcissistic. You really didn't want to get on the wrong side of him. His most trusted advisor, Thomas Cromwell, was executed for nothing more than orchestrating his marriage to Anne of Cleves. When Henry wasn't having those around him executed, he was waging war against Scotland and France. He was a completely useless commander, and practically brought England to its knees. Henry was a pretty terrible monarch. King John is probably considered England's most useless and evil king. Portrayed as the villain in Robin Hood, he certainly stands up to his evil reputation. John was the youngest and favourite son of Henry II and was born around Christmas time in 1166. As the youngest of five male children, John was never intended to wear the crown, and with all the land and titles being handed out to his brothers, he gained the nickname Lackland. Whilst John was not unique amongst his brothers for being treacherous, he did cement his reputation when his brother Richard the Lionheart became king in 1189. With his other brothers dead, he attempted to usurp Richard when he was off on crusade. With a little help from Philip Augustus of France, he was nearly successful. When Richard died in 1199, John somehow found himself sitting on the English throne. His brother had however acknowledged their nephew Arthur as heir to the throne several years earlier. Arthur did in fact have a better claim. But this was no issue for John, he just had him killed. As well as being treacherous, John was also immensely cruel, and chivalry meant absolutely nothing to him. Where others would capture their enemies as opposed to killing them, John would just do the latter. He was universally hated by everybody. He was a bastard. He pissed off his barons by sleeping with their wives and suppressing their baronial rights. He even fell out with the King of France and lost the entirety of Normandy as a consequence. A monumental blunder. John raised taxes and demanded money in order to take back his continental dominions. He further pissed off his barons who rebelled against him and his hand was forced into signing Magna Carta. John being John, however, he soon went back on his word. France invaded England on the request of his barons and everybody was at war. It was just awesome. In fact, the only good thing John ever did was dying. In 1216, his son Henry III took to the throne at the ripe old age of nine. To think of it, he turned out to be pretty useless as well.